Cool. We are now recording. So how do we get tokens to cross the chasm? <laughs> Any ideas? I have some ideas. Um, so I guess I'll introduce myself first really quick. Hi, I'm Niran. Uh, I worked this for a while. I am in Panball, a project that I founded in 2018, and we try to subsidize community. Uh, I think the way that we get tokens to cross the chasm is probably by uh, changing the metaphors that we use to think about what's going on here. Uh, the dominant metaphor for these tokens is currency, and I think it's it's a fairly good one. It fits a lot of what's done with uh, fiat currencies, uh, commodity currencies that people are used to. Uh, but the metaphor that I use more often in my thinking is really more like land. Um, and if you think of what's going on with these communities that get built, uh, you can kind of use the metaphor of like early American settlement, where you have all this land out west, and it's basically being given out to people to build this kind of culture, to build a nation that actually spreads further than the first 13 colonies. How are you actually going to get people to use all this land and acquire it as the result of conquest or purchase? Like, uh, you kind of have to give it away, get people to start using it, build up communities out there, and then eventually you get to this manifest destiny where you have see the shining, see the shining city filled with people who have the shared national sort of bond. And it's kind of what I see happening with these tokens. You start just giving them out, whether it's Bitcoin or Ether, you give them out to people, people start participating in the network in one way or another, and then a couple of years later, you see a whole vibrant community organized around this token. It's less about the use as money and more about the uh, land type, uh, the, the land holdings, you might say, that ties people together and feels like they have a shared, um, shared incentive to cooperate. And I think you can do that very broadly. I think we've only scratched the surface of what you can do with that. Uh, but if we think about it less in terms of people launching their own tokens and more about <clears throat> getting communities to kind of like uh, um, helping them just give away stuff to tie them, uh, to tie the community tighter together. Like it doesn't necessarily have to be that we're building the tools for people to launch more and more tokens. It might be that we're just saying, hey, you have a community, here's this process that you need to go through. Maybe there's a token that you can already use to do this, but like it's really about getting people to start uh, introducing assets into their communities and seeing what happens. Uh, it might have negative effects, so they don't necessarily want to go too far. But trying to introduce these into more communities uh, it doesn't seem like a huge technical lift. It's really a storytelling lift, and we, I don't think we have that story yet. I really like the land um, metaphor and like it, it, it's useful to use the United States as an analogy and like think about manifest destiny, think about the positives and the negatives of like how that journey West went. And just like, I think Mark bringing this conversation up is, is useful right now because we kind of have the choice where it's, it's no longer like so crazy. I think like, I think there are very like, talented, well-intentioned people in this space who are personable and like have many connections, many more connections outside of Web3 than they do within Web3, actually. Um, and like can use their personal reputation to say, hey, there's this really dope community that I'm a part of, of like very like high functioning, interesting individuals that like would be great people to like for you to spend time with. Um, and I've, I've been like more willing to do that uh, in 2020 than ever before within crypto. And it's important to, to, the, to the story and to, to the land story, Niren, because, because it allows us to, to spread the pie, right? And, and to not get lost in the, like, the idea that, you know, we all are here and we should just keep doing it ourselves, right? Like that there is a growing positive sum game and it, it actually gets better and better and better should we continue to invite and invite and invite other people? So very practically, like for, for Colonel, as we do this expo week, my plan is to invite like, um, like mentors, like investors, people who like might be able to like practically 
like get involved with with these web three teams but also to invite like 50 of my like friends and say like yo we're going to be on the software air meet there's gonna be a bunch of interesting people presenting interesting projects you probably won't understand a lot of it but like you're interested in tech um see these dope people and like see what they're doing and just come hang out and like let us know what you think um but but taking that to the next step would be like join the pinballa league with me as a part of kernel perhaps you know or like um alex you going to somebody with your token who's like just a good friend of yours who like literally knows nothing about crypto but saying like yo you're one of my best friends like in the world and like here's my token and like come hang out with like and i you might have done it I don't what know. i've done this is what i've done like i was just playing fifa with a friend like last year and i gave him like what now amounts to two thousand dollars <laughs> of Alex tokens, and he was like, "Dude, I am getting into the space, man." <laughs> yeah. But so I think so. Attention on what I just said is um, there's a sentence which is, uh, "You can build a community very efficiently if you make your early adopters rich." So, and I think we can generalize this to you can build a great community if you provide a lot of value, w- whether it's money or not. And so we've seen yield farming and how to incentivize people for lending protocols. But what about for, so for me, crossing the chasm would be offering, translating and repackaging yield farming into products that people use. So let's say it was a Uber company, well, the rides would be heavily discounted. And, and you would not say you are getting Uber shares and the Uber shares subsidize the right. You would just heavily subsidize the rights in a way that is uh, not done before. And then maybe after a while for the top writers, you explain to them that, you know, you have a stake in Uber now and you can check, you can like select to open a city or something. And so uh, I think it's translating what's been working. And as Mark said, it worked for Bitcoin, uh, you know, like Maximalist together, then Ethereum open source dev, and now DeFi entrepreneurs. And so what's the next step? And I completely agree that community tokens is a huge thing. And uh, yeah, like there's no rivalry with personal tokens. I know that personal tokens is a bit shorter sighted and I plan to probably add my token in like two, three years time, whereas, uh, you know, community strive for decades. So uh, totally understand this point. And um, yeah, bullish on this conversation. Yeah, but I, I, think, I think personal tokens are just uh, an extension of this idea, right? I mean, it's you're creating community, you're giving this value to the community yeah. And I, I think it was interesting, either Niran said it or, or in the talk, you know, extracting the idea only of money or Niran said it, it, it and like the idea of, of land, I, I like that. That reminds me of like the Bankless podcast. I think they always talk about like going west and like staking a new land, which I, I think resonates well with me. But I think also just uh, my my background is from like stock investing so just just the idea of having ownership and it turns it, the whole concept of ownership completely changes right like i think back to the way back in the day when i would like you know try to see what trends like oh a lot of people use procter and Gra- gamble toothpaste so that must be a good brand and then like i buy procter and gamble gamble whenever i'm at the grocery because i'm a stockholder I'm a shareholder, but it's, it's such a gigantic company that you can do such more interesting things with these community tokens and incentivize people to have that ownership value or have that ownership mentality, but at such a deeper level that it's like, I'm part of this community, I'm contributing. So I think uh, another interesting point was like, how can you incentivize um, providing value to all of these people uh, that's not so heavily weighted at the beginning of the protocol, you know, like the early Bitcoin miners that, you know, I have, I have friends that like bought drugs on Silk Road and they forget about Bitcoin dust, you know, and then it's like, they're a millionaire. And you're like, damn it, man. Like that, that was, that was really, you know, are, were you really smart and like included in the community or is it, it was just dumb luck. And now, now you're sitting really pretty. So I think like, figuring out how to properly continue to incentivize the community to be a part, to contribute, to earn something that's, that's, you know, uh, substantial, substantial enough to care uh, throughout the lifetime of the protocol is also very, very important. 
reminds me actually of, of something we noticed, and this was when I was sort of working on bounties full time, was that that it was a by by giving other people your tokens, right? By like turning them into from users into like what is basically an employee, that their perspective, that that was itself a marketing tool, that it was a manner in which you could get them to, you know, like if you think about the person or company that you work for right now, you love them. You know, even if you're just a freelancer, you sort of like think about them differently than anybody else because like you're, it's a part of you. You, you see yourself as a, a sort of subset of that. And so what we realized was that, yeah, we were, and we were trying to, you know, scream this from the top of like the rooftops was like, if you have a token, like give it to people and that will be your market. Like that's your marketing expense. Just give them the money and like they will automatically feel as though they're sort of a part of your community and your community ends up being this sort of like amorphous blurry sort of thing where the people in the very core of it are the people who maybe hold the most tokens or feel the most empowered or, or, or um, play the biggest roles in that community. But as you sort of zoom out, you have these people on the periphery that are sort of maybe doing little bits of work or earning a little bit, even just for, you know, things like DeFi farming, yield farming, or, you know, taking an Uber ride as a user, you're sort of like still sort of being brought in with this like gravitational pull of owning tokens. Mm -hmm. And, and I think this idea of like making your early adopters rich is really interesting because it's not just about making them rich. It's it, because I think that's like cool, right? It's like, you know, giving them a bunch of fiat currency is like making them rich. But what community tokens do that, that it didn't, didn't exist before is like sort of this alignment of incentives where they only become rich if the community becomes rich, right? That, that, that they're sort of rich contingent upon the community succeeding. And that if the community fails, they aren't rich at all. They've actually made like no money at all. And the, you know, if you've ever held a shit coin for too long and, and the community eventually like collapsed, like this is what happens, right? And so it's this like contingent wealth that is really interesting because it like forces everyone to say, okay, we will all be rich, but only if we work together. So let's work together, which I think is like a really interesting and beautiful, beautiful thing as a sort of starting point, because I think like from there, you know, like real trust, real friendship, real relationships, you know, need to be built and they do get built. But this is the sort of like foot in the door to get people to like in the same room together to like care enough about each other and like what they're all doing to, to be able to like sort of build those second, third layer uh, aspects of relationship. Uh, I really love that dynamic. And I think there's uh, like, there's so much potential in it because that whole, like, if we work together, then we all get rich thing is, I, I think it's half the story. And that's the story that we've like participated in so far, where it's like, hey, if you can increase your private wealth by working together with this community. And I think if we can find a way to also make it true that if we work together, we also increase our commonwealth, our social wealth, the wealth of our communities, uh, I think that's kind of a world changing shift where instead of just like, uh, going back to that land analogy, like if you think of uh, government as a purely selfish entity uh, and you're like giving away the land, well, if you're super selfish, you're like, I'm going to give away this land because eventually they're going to build cities on top of this land and they're going to pay taxes. And that tax, those taxes are going to fund stuff that we do together. And right now, none of the systems that we're building really have that dynamic. There's no possibility of the people who hold on to these things to ever really contribute. It's just kind of, it's purely private wealth. And not, not to say that there needs to be some sort of like tax for tokens, but if these are all narrative based systems, if they're heavily based on the story that we tell about what these tokens are for, what our communities are for, then just tell people that we're funding communities together and that's how you bootstrap your whole thing then I think you can get both that private wealth effect as well as that common wealth effect at the same time. And I think those two things working together are what makes these things broadly valuable for people even outside uh, the technology, people interested in technology. Uh, not everybody interested in speculating on things, but pretty much everyone is interested in having their communities be revitalized. Uh, I, I think that would be something that uh, would have very large mass appeal if we could figure out a way to make it work. 
one of the ideas that I shared in the other, and my apologies if I'm talking too much, but I, I want to sort of share some of these insights we had from the other Junto because I think they'll be sort of good to stir the pot with this one. And one of the things that we that we talked about was this idea that tokens can be this form of debt. Uh, to your community members, where like community members can work to earn a token, even when that token, where the work that they're doing creates some value in the world, and they can be paid in a token before that value is sort of realized, right? And so you can like sort of print money out of thin air. It's like sort of debt by the people for the people instead of debt by central government. It's very like grassroots debt. Um, and, but it's this idea of like, if you can, you can convince people that this money will be worth something later, right? You can convince that the community will sort of pay you back by making these tokens worth something. Then you can get people to, yeah, like do work out of, out of nowhere to, to, um, to create and like create value out of thin air. And this is the sort of like part where the land analogy breaks off because we have like a very fixed amount of land. There's only like one earth that we live on, but you know, launching like new pockets of earth everywhere around us it sort of infinitely is like incredibly beautiful. And so there's just so much potential. <laughs> yeah, I totally echo that and, uh, and agree. And um, I think before the world was a bit more, um, you know, zero sum, but crypto really does enable uh, composability and all those properties make it possible for like, you know, Red Exchange or Geekcoin Public Good Funding or, you know, Moloch DAO, where like, you know, Moloch DAO, like people could just do it to research on their own, right? But tragedy of the commons and free riders uh, happen. And so this is why like no progress is being done by a single team. And so everyone is pooling one person of each fund. And at the end of the day, it ends up being like a super coordinated team where every team doing applications in crypto benefit from ETH2 research being uh, like advancing at a rapid pace. Um, and so my question to you all is, we all understand that this is positive for some game, this is amazing and we want people to do that. And we've done this personally, like I was part of some DAOs like Meta Cartel, Marketing DAO uh, and others. And we were at like level zero of community, which is like, you know, pooling funds, just a community bank account which is, you know, the atomic level of community management. But uh, we've had many ideas around doing a sort of deterministic hierarchy of how to advance in the community reputation. And I missed the talk yesterday, but maybe Don Dion had some good ideas with source cred. And I think that would be the amazing part. Just imagine if like, you know, kernel 2.0 is like, you know, to earn your first kernel, you need to meet five people. And so everyone is incentivized to meet everyone that way. And then the second level is, you know, you do a project for one weekend with at least two other people that we will pick at random or something. And so if you literally force serendipity, um, then friendships will happen and all the things that you wish uh, will happen organically afterwards. But so how do we do that? Like I've been talking to people about this idea for ages, but like it's so, it seems extremely hard to do in practice. I feel like. And so um, what is it? What is the blocker? I don't know what's the blocker. It does feel like it's easy for a smart contract. Like, is it because people would just game the system and they would say they meet each other just to get rich? So like civil resistance, I guess. Yeah. Well, there's, there's one big idea from Dandelion's talk, which was this idea of like non-transactional relationships. And like this idea effectively was like, the way that, the way that uh, he described it was like, in, in the future, there will be source cred historians who will go back in time and like say like, okay, like six months ago, this guy met that guy through this thing and they generated this value and like six months thereafter, it's clear that like they did something like incredible. And, and only post facto will you get this like reward that's associated with this thing that happened six months ago. And by not being so deterministic on like, do x thing get y result but more saying this is a community we don't know what's going to be valuable we don't know what six months or a year from now is going to prove to be the, the useful thing um we're able to like give ourselves more um ability to kind of like navigate that but but more importantly psychologically for the people that are in the community the the ask is more broad it's give first and if you give you don't know exactly how but you will likely return like you will get something back and like play the positive some game, but play it long term, play it iteratively and like just trust that it'll play out because like the facts will 
will like work in that favor um, in in the source code model, but also in like I'm hoping in the kernel model even without tokens for now and and perhaps with them later. Yeah, the only thing I'll add because I don't think the civil resistance part is as difficult, right? Because we can sort of curate you know who's able to earn the token. So that part seems more taken care of. But what yeah, what Vivek said of gamification and people just doing things just to earn the money or 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 the sort of relationships being watered down by this, I think that's super important. And you know, one of the insights uh, James Young shared during the earlier Junto was like a community needs time before a token can be added. And the example he gave with Bitcoin is that it was actually the cypherpunk community that already existed, that already had a culture, a set of norms, a, the group of people, they had relationships, and that token was added later um, to sweeten that community. But if that token existed sort of at the beginning of that community, that it would be a failure because, yeah, ultimately things would become very transactional. And so, like, and one of the questions we asked during that conversation, which, you know, we didn't really answer, but, you know, was like, how, how do you know when your community is ready to have tokens? start to be sprinkled in? How do you know when, when there's enough sort of culture, when the values are hardened, when the relationships are meaningful and real in, enough that you don't have to sort of worry that your core group will become just so money hungry or token hungry that um, the, the sort of best parts of the community, the juices will be like squeezed out by people, you know, just, just gaming it. Um, and it's a, it's a tough question to ask, but there is, it does seem like there is some sort of like threshold that a community needs to get to before tokens should be added because yeah, if it's too early, it'll, you'll just, you'll ruin it. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I think about is like going to existing examples of like organizations and just seeing like uh, what's working there. And the one that keeps coming back to me over and over again is college campuses. Like uh, I think there's a lot of inspiration to take in from how colleges make community work. They're getting all these new people from all over the country or all over the world. And by the end of four years, like this tight community has formed. And uh, I, I think there's um, a, a lot of roles that get filled in college communities that are where people are doing work and not necessarily getting a financial reward from it, for it, even when these universities are extremely wealthy. There's colleges that have billions of dollars of endowments and they could really spend money however they wanted to cultivate community campus and in a lot of places, they don't do it. So my hypothesis is that like uh, the there's so much that um, they've already figured out just by trying things and succeeding and failing over and over again, that if you just copy most of what's going on there wholesale, uh, reward the things financially that they reward, reward the things financially that they don't reward. I, I think there's a lot uh, that can be done from just stealing from colleges stealing from sororities and fraternities, stealing from student clubs, stealing from everything that's going on in this very vibrant uh, example of like a, uh, an enclave for civic life and seeing what we can uh, make work in this new form of civic life that's very nascent. I love, I love this analogy like a lot. Niran wrote about this. Niran, if you don't mind putting that in chat, that, that post that you wrote about civic life in cyberspace is like, I, I think it's, yeah, I think it's worthy of its own Junta. But I'm curious, uh, Bianca, if, if you have anything, I know we've been kind of like running around in circles and see, see you writing stuff down, but curious. Yeah, I was taking notes because, yeah, I was actually thinking about the scientific community and all the, the questionnaires that I've been doing about our project. And actually, um, maybe the case that uh, we have is a bit the opposite in the sense that uh, there is sort of a strong community, even if, between people who don't know each other, but just because of, for, because of the fact that, in a sense, they, they feel like they belong to the scientific community. And, and people are actually afraid uh, of introducing, well, they would like to have uh, some sort of reward and recognition for their work, um, but um, which in the case of our project is uh, for peer reviewing articles, but also they're afraid that if you introduce the monetary reward, then, it will kind of, you know, like uh, ruin the system. And actually it's interesting because I've been reading uh, some, there are a lot of experimental studies showing that people uh, don't feel like doing scientific work if they are actually paid for it. Mm -hmm. So 
I don't know how how this would work. And then uh, since Mark was say, was saying like we should have a community first, and then we bring the token in. And what if the community doesn't want the token? <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> Uh, at the same time, they want, I mean, there is a need for incentivization. So, yeah, that was a bit. And also, uh, and also just sort of sharing ownership, right? Like if a lot of people are doing research, you know, sometimes research can be less valuable, right? And that's still useful research to do, even if it doesn't exactly. immediately translate into money. But I think a lot of times, and this is, again, I'm not in the scientific community, so maybe I'm wrong, but it does seem like there's oftentimes so much contribution that goes into scientific discovery that goes like uncredited or ignored yes. and like very valuable scientific achievements will be made and the sort of people who were there to make sure that that occurred are never never see any of the benefits from that and I think you know there's something to be said of course about incentives maligning things or ruining experiments and things like that but I also think that it's like very unfair you know that that people don't get paid and that people are sort of taken advantage in this way um where where they do a lot of hard work you know because they're passionate and in the end um their passion is sort of taken advantage of um or, or yeah. harnessed uh, for someone else's benefit monetary benefit mark i'm curious if you have an example in mind and, and i want to use it like because i know there's many but i just like for for example like illustrative purposes and then bianca if you have like i don't know if you have one in mind but i know that this happens a lot my my I think Bianca, I've told you this, my dad's been working in breast cancer research for like 25 years. He's a very like meek, quiet person. He doesn't like go to the, um, to the front of the like grant line and like really push for his application to make its way through. And I think he's been working on some like really interesting stuff for the last like five, seven years. And I think I know more about it than like MD Anderson knows about it. Um, partially because they like just don't see it. <laughs> and like they don't take the time to pay attention and he's not going to go yell about it anywhere. Um, but but um, like, I'm curious, Bianca, what you think about this model where it's like, um, it's not immediate transactional, you get paid when you review, but more you put your work out, you engage in the community. And at some point, at some later date, this community is tokenized and people could get paid, like not directly related to X thing getting done. Like, do you think that that would be interesting in the scientific community? Do you think that like people would would join something that's set up in that capacity? I guess I'm just curious. So, so basically, in a way that uh, Dandelion is describing source cred, because I understood that in a way, uh, what he uh, in his idea, like um, or in the idea, is um, basically there is there are two aspects. One is the reputation, the other one is the reward, which is really interesting. So the cred, it's basically represents a reputation and this never goes away. And you can always uh, write, uh, go back actually, you can lose your reputation, but you can also earn a reputation. But uh, the reward is represented by this token, which is the grain and this, okay, you accumulate it, but also uh, it's kind of dissociated by the reputation. So I think this is interesting, right? Um, be, and I remember I watched one of the videos um, of one of his presentation. There was this really nice uh, analogy with uh, Rosalind Franklin and <laughs> uh, Watson and Creek for the discovery of DNA and uh, how she didn't get uh, she didn't get the proper value for for what she discovered. I mean, in my point of view, and maybe in many people's point of view, uh, she would be the one with the Nobel Prize and not them, right? <laughs> So if the system was retroactive, like the source cred is trying to do, then we would have given more reputation to her. But actually, it's uh, the other two who were more front in line, and because of the time and the advantage, they were men. and na they got uh, yeah. So maybe, maybe even would, rewards uh, going down to like her, like the people who are a part of her family tree, right? Like, is yeah. that that would be like the crazy? Yeah, actually, I think. Yeah, yeah, well, usually I think when uh, in academia, what you see uh, for big personalities is kind of like it becomes a family business, right? So you kind of see that there are, at least for Nobel Prize, uh, they have also children that are Nobel Prize winners and it's kind of like <laughs> an inheritance. So, yeah, but 
get, getting back to the point of uh, a reward uh, later in time, I found interesting the, the other metaphor that Dan the Lion uh, used, which was about uh, Christianity. Like he was saying, uh, they were saying like the system is kind of like uh, you, you behave well, and then at some point uh, you will be rewarded for your good behavior, right? <laughs> I found it really... <laughs> I know if we said, uh, they said that during the, the official presentation, it was our, in our airmate table, but uh, I, I found it really funny. And, that, might have, uh, that might have been in the airmate. <laughs> that might have been in the maybe, maybe it was in the airmate. I, I think it would be interesting, um, but maybe in the scientific community, that's what's happening. People are just accepting any conditions because they think, okay, at some point we will be rewarded, <laughs> but uh, we, we are, haven't seen the time yet. So I don't know, maybe uh, like uh, an immediate reward that would be something that would change the system. I don't know what you think about this. <laughs> You're not convinced. This actually, like... <laughs> it, this actually touches on one of the ideas that we talked about also during the last Junto was this idea that communities are almost always led by benevolent dictators, that this is something we sort of see constantly. And, you know, we call them like community managers or whatever, but like very oftentimes, like there is a level of trust that is sort of endowed upon an individual or a small group of people who are the like community managers. And so, yeah, you know, Bianca, to your point, like that, there, that trust is there. And that if people sort of have this trust that they'll eventually get paid and those people who are sort of leading this community end up, you know, not following through on, on what they've sort of promised or not sharing value in a way that's, that's fair, that can be, yeah, incredibly damaging. And so that's like the sort of two sides of this, this idea that like for there to be incentives given out later, there sort of needs to be a group of people who's allowed to give those incentives out, maybe a smaller group of people. And that necessarily implies like trust. Um, which is sometimes, I think, a good thing. Trust can be very beautiful, but also trust can be, people can take advantage of trust all the time, right? And so this is the one of the trickier parts of, of you know, building tokenized communities, I think, and trying to distribute value is like doing it in a way that's, that's fair, that everybody who, who participated feels like they didn't get shortchanged, uh, right. which is tough because I think that oftentimes happens even when the distribution is fair, right? Like sort of no one will ever be happy with what they get. Um, so it's it's tricky. It's like a really hard problem. Uh, for me, one important thing in all these communities uh, and systems that we're building is the notion of uh, competition and choice. Uh, I think a lot of the existing models that uh, are common are basically like, hey, we have this one big system and you're either in it or you're out. You're either in Bitcoin or you're out of it. You're either in Ethereum or you're out of it. And I think if we're talking about communities rather than technologies, I think it's important that people that there's not necessarily that sort of binary thing. Like uh, if, we, if we want people to be as happy as possible without like giving up their agency so they can be part of this giant thing, then there needs to be choices that people can make within these systems. So if they feel like this one corner of the community isn't uh, treating them the way they want to be treated or is doing something that they don't really agree with, that there's somewhere else that they can go to. Uh, so like, I, I think thinking of, a lot of these communities as intentionally competing with one another to be the, the community that people choose to be a part of, I think is a valuable concept. So people don't uh, like, uh, if, if, if these things play out the way that Bitcoin and Ether has, then there's kind of this power law where there's one giant big thing, uh, Bitcoin, another kind of big thing, Ether, and then it trails off from there. So people feel this pressure to be part of the biggest thing. And if those biggest things don't have opportunity for choice within them, then I don't think that's necessarily the world that we want to build. Uh, but if we can intentionally design these things to make sure that like uh, there's still fluid choice and fluid competition that's making sure that the, the best things kind of rise to the top, I think that's uh, what's going to make people thrive. Uh, to me, choice is really the raw material of things that thrive. And once choice breaks down, even if it's not a top-down thing, like markets extinguish choice all the time through monopolies. So we should expect that sort of dynamic to play out and uh, plan for it. And, and when you say expecting that to play out, like, could you imagine like, um, like I guess I have two parts to the question. One part is like, how, how do you square that with something like Dunbar's number, which, which states that like, you know, there's only a small subset of people that you can like really deeply engage with. Um, 
and and yeah w what does that look like to you in terms of like how how our communities will scale like i think there's two parts to this conversation is like from the way mark framed it like there will be thousands of communities tokenized communities for sure um but then i think near in the point that you're making is that there will there will perhaps be one or two or three or four that are like the biggest of them and like can we can we like square those two things um and and make room for like good things to happen within even the smaller gr groups that are let's say 100 person communities that never expect to be bigger than that for whatever reason the example that comes to my mind vivek is is meta cartel which is i think at this point post Dunbar number size. Like I think there's more than 150 people in Meta Cartel. I'm not a member, so I'm not sure. Alex, you'll have to tell. Member, me. I can speak if you want. But yeah, like um, Meta Cartel is amazing. Wait, one second. Um, the reason why Meta Cartel is amazing is because um, it was very polarizing. Like the logo was extremely weird, and also it was bear market. So like we didn't have the money problem. Everyone that was in Meta Cartel, we filtered out. It was people who are not in it for the money. Um, and the fact, I think one degree of qualifying, quantifying success for a community is, uh, okay, sure. Like there's a limited number of people we can get very close to, but I feel comfortable reaching out to anyone in Zakatel because we have this community boundaries. And so if I want to, like it's trust minimized. And this is what James Song says a lot. Like it's not about trustlessness. That's for DeFi protocols and code for humans it's trust minimization. But the cartel, it's amazing because I feel, and I think the same is for Kernel as well because I feel completely normal reaching to anyone in Kernel right now because we're all protected by this, you know, uh, benevolent Vivek and uh, Gitcoin. And I think that everyone here is awesome and like positive and everything. And so these are like the community, I think, uh, aspects um, that makes Metacatel good. And so now Metacatel has money and it's a venture fund. But as we said, it started without the money. The community was great. And how, how to qualify, I think it's talk to your users. So like Peter Pan knows everything. He spent his year just talking to everyone, getting friends with everybody, just like Vivek is doing always on, like chatting and uh, keeping in touch with everyone and doing connections all the time. And so that's when you know, okay, now it's the threshold is reached uh, and we can have a token and we can pay people and we can have capitalism embedded into it. Yeah, and the thing, the thing that I'll add, and this is again, from my outsider perspective, is that it seems like a lot of the coolest things that are sort of coming out of Meta Cartel right now are not sort of coming out of the main Meta Cartel, but are actually coming out of these offshoots, right? We have like Raid Guild, Meta Gamma Delta, we have the Meta Cartel Ventures, which are each sort of like sub communities. And so it seems like Meta Cartel grew, I think they grew past Dunbar number and started like sort of offshooting into these smaller ones. And the beauty of community is that it's just sort of a web of relationships. And so if a subset of those people already have those relationships and have a separate interest or separate set of goals, like that starting a new community can be very quick, like efficient if, if the sort of foundation is already there, if people already trust each other, they already like each other um, and know each other enough to, to work with each other without needing token incentives or, 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 you know, having a culture and things like that. So that I think is like the really interesting thing about this idea of, of communities, Vivek, what you said, like sort of Dunbar number, how do we scale is like not actually necessarily requiring that they scale in, in a sort of explicit sense, right? But actually letting them not scale, letting them like sort of splinter into these smaller things. And that those smaller ones, I'm sure if Meta Gamma Delta becomes huge as well, then you know they, they might also splinter into different sort of like uh, groups, maybe based on location or something like mm -hmm. that. But you know, it's, so it's like, I think it's really interesting to see how that happens over time, very like organically, very naturally. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for small communities. Like I, I'm part of Meta Cartel as well, and I love the fact that there's it's still possible to maintain pretty tight relationships with about 110 people, and then the smaller groups that are forming are great as well. Uh, I, I think uh, I, I think it's important to think at like every level of social scale because if um, if 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 we think of this technology that we're building with as this kind of blank slate for social organization. Like, uh, it's not necessarily just the small scale communities that will arise from these things, it's large scale ones as well. And we're all parts of so many different communities at the same time, whether it's uh, some, like something like Kernel or Meta Cartel, whether it's something like a, um, 
uh, alumni network for a university, or whether it's something like a nation uh, that works together at a very large scale. And I think there's going to be things at all, the, all of these different scales. There's not like one thing to rule them all. Uh, and I think all these things are going to exist. But before, uh, like, I, I think once tokens start to be introduced into the thing, um, almost every token uh, seems to imbue a community with a manifest destiny kind of mindset where they want to grow large. Bitcoin wants to be the currency. If Ethereum wants to be the financial platform, uh, even though within the Ethereum ecosystem, we like, I, I think we have a good cultural ethos of not trying to like dominate things, uh, but it's really uh, with one exception, <laughs> like everyone still wants either to be dominant. <laughs> um, and I, I think that's fine. I think it's the natural order of things. But once, we, once the tokens start getting it, uh, introduced into these things, pe people's values will be shaped by the incentives. And I think we need a plan for that as well. So if, if, we, if there are these communities with tokens, I expect them to try to be large. MetaCartel, for instance, uh, that doesn't have a token yet. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily, like size isn't necessarily its goal. Uh, size isn't necessarily the goal of kernel. But I think these token communities, they all want size. Hmm. Yeah, this is where, like there's, there's two simultaneous thoughts. One that I've been like holding onto for a while, but, but I think it's like, really important and then one that that i guess scares me so like one is like why why we definitely should do this right like it seems like the right time it seems like the right place um and it's that like i feel like in this call right here we are all in like the top 10 percent of like having a good uh cyber civic life in what niran has been calling it i have like many many friends that i make that i only hang out with on the internet and i feel like genuine happiness and excitement about it Whereas I know that most of my friends are like on Instagram feeds and Twitter feeds, just like hating that and like really, really hating it. So on like a very individual level, like I feel like it, it is clearly going to be better for like individuals to like be a part of these tokenized communities to like have a proper like social dynamic on the internet that like, that feels good. Of course, like dating on the internet might not, might not be the easiest thing to do. So there's like things you have to do in person, but like there are many things that you can do. And, um, the, so that's all good. Um, the part that does concern me, I think, Niran, is, is, is what like, you just described, which is this, like, this dynamic that like, has hit social media today, like 10 years later, where like, now we see the impact of like, full-scale social media with billions of users, with like, people who are like, turning into brands, whether they like it or not, because that is the dynamic of the platform. And so like, early stage tokenized communities, it's all like, great it's like well there's all this land let's all make communities let's like i'll grow them um but like instagram was great too when it was a hundred thousand users it was fucking awesome it was just like this cool place with cat photos and like a lot of happiness and like just like great things and so like unless we are like i think what you just brought up is actually perhaps the key point of like um of like if we are going to take it mainstream and do it in a way that like protects like at all costs the first thing which is like the social dynamic the feeling of community by necessity like unless we're going to create like the same like conflicts again where this community thinks they're better than that community and the bitcoin's better than ethereum which is the only one that we've really seen played out at decade scale like over the last 10 years um like we have to be very like we have to ask the questions of, like how do we avoid bitcoin versus ethereum when there's thousands of them right because like that's been even more toxic than like democrats versus republicans in most cases like it's been like even worse and so like that's that's part of the concerns me while also it feels like the positives are too much to like not try um so anyways i i actually vivek will challenge you on your point that it's a bad thing that this competition exists and i actually think that it's a very good thing i mean it can it like ultimately like toxic hate is not a good thing and like competition can become very toxic and so there's like good and bad competition but competition as an idea is not bad and that i do think we'll see a lot of competition as like we start to see more communities especially because and this is something i i noticed off of reddit like two years ago i don't use reddit anymore i find the communities are too big 
um, they're not they're not interesting anymore. I call it like the open ocean problem, and that the best Reddit communities were the ones that existed up until like twenty thousand people. If they get past twenty thousand people, you know, the sort of they get on the homepage, everybody floods in, and then the quality of the discourse, the quality of the community, completely goes away. And so, instead of the question being how can we take these small communities mainstream, it's actually how can we grow these communities without them going mainstream, without them requiring to have everyone, without them, you know, and, and that necessarily means there's going to be like 10 or 20 or 100 different meme communities, right, that might share some of the same content, but will very much sort of be in contrast to each other based on who is in those communities. And, and they might feel some, some competition with each other, which I think can be, you know, very healthy if, if the culture around community competition can be one that's healthy. I think one of the examples that comes to mind is like soccer communities, where there's so much competition between communities around different teams, but you don't really see that competition becoming like ultra, ultra toxic too much. People don't really talk shit about like Arsenal fans or Chelsea fans, whatever. Like they do a little bit, but it's sort of like playful and they know that this is sort of like the fun of the game, the love of the sport. And so like at the sort of meta culture or meta community level is like thinking about communities competing but in like a friendly way and having different communities who do compete but sort of pave the road that it's possible to compete without being like awful people to each other because I do think it's possible and and meaningful and that like yeah competition isn't isn't always a bad thing yeah I think competition is great I, I think uh if, if it's possible for us to design with uh, something where there's competition between communities, but there's something that binds them together. I think that's where the most potential is. I think when there's nothing to bind people together, I think that's actually a very dangerous situation. Uh, like if you take the soccer hooligan example, if you gave them a budget, I do think you would see very bad things. <laughs> uh, I, think you, I think you would see soccer crusades where they fund their militias. It, it could go great. Uh, but uh, like, I, I think uh, we, we definitely want competition because competition is good. It's what produces choices for people to choose from. Uh, but if, um, if, if we end up with all these different large communities with no, no shared incentive to cooperate, I think uh, things could go bad very quickly. Uh, not, maybe not very quickly, but eventually. Um, like, um, I, I think if there's like uh, the, the model in my head is like uh, fewer tokens with more communities, like finding models where uh, multiple communities can share a token, I think is uh, something with a lot of potential. Uh, if you think about the economics of cooperatives where they're trying to, where, where it's not necessarily entirely based on ownership, it's kind of uh, trying to return value to individuals or producers based on the size of their patronage. Uh, I think that's the kind of model that can help people share tokens together, where it's like, and it's not necessarily about how much of the token your community earns, but it's based on the size of their patronage and uh, making sure that they get that sort of value proportionally as well. I think it makes it a no brainer for people to work together on fewer tokens. So you might have thousands and thousands of communities, which is exactly what we want, but fewer and fewer tokens because again, I think tokens are very similar logically to borders when it comes to states. Like tokens are the borders of civic life, I think. And uh, I, I, I don't know how many of those we want. Hmm. I think the fact that crypto is decentralizing, creating new communities, and it's not just Silicon Valley, which, which has an ethos of you know, scaling to the billions, scaling to the billions all the time, uh, if we give that, you know, that tool to anyone, then people will say, well, we're not going to go for the billion dollar company play. We just want 20,000 people, as you said, Mark, as like the cap. We want to, you know, stay a tight community and not scale. But right now, the people able to do this, raising funds, et cetera, are like they're pressured and they want to do and scale to, uh, you know, global scale. Um, so this will be interesting to cap the thing. It's like right now, it's either you have a small medium business or you're shooting for a startup and the middle ground for communities isn't too much uh, happening. But of course, like uh, Niran and like all of you guys work is probably uh, heading towards it. I, I am very curious about that Niran and, and Alex, like you as well, like as a founder who's like coming up within the crypto world is like this like, 
like what happens when it's not VC funding or nothing? What happens when there are like these middle layers and grants, grants programs are kind of like the start of that. I think like Benbala and like SourceCred and others are like starting to get towards the next level where it's like, it's probably not just grant funding. Maybe there's like some other like requirements, but it's not, it's not VC scale or bust. And, and that allows for like really strong financial outcomes for founders without the requirement for billions of users. Um, so I don't know, Alex, if you as a, as a founder are thinking about that, Niran as Ben Vala is like a funding mechanism or thinking about that, but open to anyone really who's, who has ideas. Uh, personally, I'm still quite bullish on VCs. And if you look at the top protocols in DeFi, they all were started as VCs because I think uh, the best way to uh, create a useful product is first to start a startup. Um, then maybe, you know, your first VC can be a DAO now because there's Venture DAO and uh, the Lao by uh, consensus open law. Um, but probably it's better because just for a simple reason that, as we said, token is just a network effect booster, but you need to have that product market fit. And the best way today we found to achieve product market fit is a lean startup kind of model. Um, but then, yeah, uh, we can decentralize to a DAO and then maybe VC is not as useful because you built that product that got the right community and thus the community will be helpful. But first, you need some guidance, you need help, and you need upfront funding. And it's just much easier and faster to do it uh, the VC way. Um, and so VCs are great. Let's decentralize VCs and do the DAO VCs. And so this is why the technical ventures and the DAO are quite interesting because if you're into crypto and you know crypto is still dismissed by a lot of uh, VCs because the market cap is still very tiny uh, and it's like DeFi is still like you know very small compared to banks and, and fintech in general and so that's that's a great way to uh, you know if the DAO VCs that are earlier than the Silicon Valley VC who dismiss it they will get very wealthy and so they will probably replace VC and have a healthier model but I think investing is um, a great vehicle to drive change and um, it's, it's been working so far in DeFi. And the ICO is the counter example that, you know, uh, retail probably isn't the best uh, person to invest to uh, than people who are like actually specialized in, in investing. Yeah, the, what, what comes to my mind is, uh, I'll, I'll be brief, but the, what comes to my mind is that, yeah, VCs are ultimately very good in the short term. You're like what you said, Alex, they're, um, it's much easier to get a million dollars of VC money than to convince people to accept a million dollars worth of your new community currency to like sort of convince them of its value eventually, et cetera. But Vivek, to your point that I think is important to remember is that like the alternative to VCs is not grants. The alternative to VCs is building a business. And that like, this is the way that this was done before VCs, that you would like build something, you would sell the thing, make money off of that. And so in this sort of cycle where you can like, like I mentioned, sort of pay people with tokens that are worth so, sort of some aspect or in some way correlated to the value that gets returned later from that thing that's being built. You could imagine that like, we could, you know, if I could convince everyone on this call, hey guys, we're going to build a building like in the middle of nowhere, but once we do, we'll be able to charge tickets and throw cool parties and your tokens will be worth a share of the revenue we make then. Like we'd ever need a VC if I can convince enough of you guys to help me build this building, right? And if we can, if we can get the building built and execute on sort of like getting people to come to it, then we can sort of skip VCs altogether because we're going sort of directly to our customers. Our customers' money is what's, what's funding the, the, the process. And that those tokens, and this is the sort of debt aspect of these tokens that you're, instead of you being indebted to these VCs in a very like equity sense in a way that's like very um, extractive for lack of a better word on the VCs part, you know, they're, they, they don't add a lot except for like this sort of aspect of, of debt um, instead of giving that or having that debt be, be, be given by people who are, um, who are like active stakeholders in the creation of this thing. Um, and that that can be, and I think that's much more interesting just because, you know, VCs are really dumb. I think a lot of VCs are smart, but a lot of them are really dumb as well. And, uh, you know, a lot of what we saw with the ICO market was stupidity on the part of retail investors. I think there was also a, a crap load of stupidity on VC parts as well. And so like uh, being able to avoid that altogether, never having to try to justify why the thing you think are building is cool, but talk directly to the people, you know, the engineers or, 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 you know, the marketers, graphic designers, whatever, who are ultimately going to be doing the work, you know, that can actually be easier than, than selling to a VC. 
And so, because they're the ones on the ground actually doing it. So uh, just sort of like re remembering that there are these very divergent paths that don't, we don't need VCs. I'm that makes sense. super excited. Of, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, super quickly. That makes sense. But VCs, like the smartest VC, as you said, will transform. So, you know, for instance, like Spencer Noon is like, for me, one of the great new VCs because he's an active user. He's your marketer. You know, he's your community manager. He's got the Telegram bots and stuff. So I think they can, some can turn good. And uh, yeah, like the bad ones, I think we agree on this. Yeah, sorry. Go on, Niran. Uh, like I'm super excited about more distributed ways of funding new kinds of projects. Uh, at the same time, I also have, uh, I think, a healthy amount of fear about it. So like with the, with the VC model, like it's a pretty like tested playbook that people understand about the dynamics of building a business with VC funding. People also understand the dynamics of building like a real business with this cash flows. But what people I think don't really understand yet is this middle ground of just distributing tokens to a whole bunch of people. And I think the, um, like uh, I'm part of a book club that's currently going through the federal, Federalist Papers, basically the founders of America going through and saying, hey, this is like things that we have to think of when we're organizing a, a nation to try to uh, produce harmony. And I think similarly, when you're distributing tokens, like the default is kind of mob rule. Like if you haven't uh, organized a community of token holders in a way where they can process uh, their discussions, their disagreements well, the default is mob rule. And I've seen like the mob come after uh, some of these people who've created their tokens and given them out and then done something that was controversial. They don't have necessarily the, like they, they don't have a board of directors. They don't have shareholders meetings. They don't have the tried and true things that allow a giant broad community of people to process their tensions in a, in a productive way and it devolves to, to model. So um, I, I think there's a lot to be liked and disliked about the VC model, but uh, I am terrified of uh, unregulated mob rule. And I, I think uh, it's really important to organize a community of token holders in ways that we don't, we don't necessarily understand what the best ways are yet. But as we test out models over time, I think we'll come up with something that works well and you'll actually get something where a broad community of stakeholders can kind of uh, incentivize the creation of a new thing from scratch. And I think that's gonna be amazing to watch. Mob rule also terrifies the heck out of me. And I definitely agree. I mean, VC, this is, this is a tried and true model. So I think we'll see these more evolutionarily, the, these different models come in because I think community tokens what we were talking about earlier, I mean, um, competition, competition is great, right? But then it, if everybody has this stake in this feeling of community, like going back to the, the soccer example, like people get, people get really strongly opinionated about their communities so much that, you know, they're willing to stab somebody with a beer bottle, like sort of thing. And that, that's, that's true community ownership, like at its finest, right? But it, well, at its probably worst, but like you feel a real sense of community so much that you're willing to do harm to somebody else. So um, to Niran's point, like that devolves a couple degrees further and you have full on mob rule, which gets really terrifying really quickly. So there's gotta be some sort of middle ground here. Uh, yeah, we, we all like to think that everybody plays nice and, and, and is in it for the, the greater good, but, uh, yeah, a lot of people are still profit profit motivated. I just got a Grindelwald flashback from Harry Potter. <laughs> Wasn't that what was that was on the walls? I don't know. Anyway, the Federalist Papers. That's a that's a gnarly book club, Niran. It's a very gnarly book club. It's the best. You're all invited. Uh, it's in the uh, the Dow Rush Week Discord. Uh, it's basically called the Summer's Corner. It's a thing that Peter Pan put together to get people who are interested in uh, DAOs to uh, have monthly meetings where we talk about that. And then the book club, uh, we're going through two of the Federalist Papers every two weeks, or I think it's every two weeks. Uh, and it's been a very interesting conversation. Very cool. yeah, it occurs to me. It occurs to me that 
having a playbook on these sorts of things or a blueprint or something is very necessary. Um, yeah. But it, we're still very early as we're trying to figure this stuff out. Well, I, I, I think you can draw parallels from a lot of these things, but it is, you know, it's different this time. It's kind of a bit uncharted territories in a number of ways, but yeah, like definitely looking at these and seeing, you know, what, what, what can you learn with everything, right? The, the question, the, the, the last like thing in the back of my head that keeps coming back up is when Niren, you were talking about individual wealth tying to commonwealth. Um, and that specific like guiding light, so to speak, as if we can optimize our communities or, or perhaps, I don't know, maybe this is my hypothesis that the communities that best do that, that best align individual wealth with commonwealth outcomes will be the ones that like win in the power law dynamic that you're, that you're, you're presenting. Um, like, I don't know, I guess it, 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 it strikes me as like really important given that like right now, the way that you make money in America is you, you have money. That's like how it happens. You don't like earn it. You, you like have money and then, and then money comes because you already had it. Um, and if you don't have money, there's like very few ways to like get to money. Um, but if this system like would worked, which is like, of course, like this has been the American dream the whole time. So it's, it's funny that, that now we're like talking about removing America from the equation and just saying, if there was a system where individual wealth could mimic like actual commonwealth, um, that that would be better. Um, I guess, yeah, I'm like, I'm very interested in like how, how we get there and I know like some of the projects I'm most interested in and, and Kernel, frankly, are like the ones that think through, that are thinking through this, that are thinking about like decarbonization as something that like obviously no government has, has really gotten right, but is clearly important for Commonwealth. And it's funny because that seems like such a hairy, tough topic to go through. But then when you get to it, it's like, this is actually the perfect thing to try this with because other things like people will just say, let's use the government. But in this case, people are like pretty clear that like the government approach is like not going to work out that well. And so like that, that's one of the situations where yes, if you could do it using new systems that we're creating, um, like, yeah, like what is to Mark's point, what is the playbook? Um, and like in general, like, like aligning that, I, I thought that was a very uh, important like distinction to make that it's not just about individual wealth, but it's, it's how individual wealth ties to commonwealth. Yeah, it's, I think it's going to be like a, a party that keeps getting better as more and more people show up, like uh, not just because the people who started it are getting richer, but because the people who are partying have a better party because somebody brought food, somebody brought drinks, like uh, uh, we, that, that's not what we're doing yet with the, the technology, but I think it's what we're going to be doing really soon. And I think like as long as you have a sort of, if you think of it like a board game, as long as people can see how the pieces in this board game could possibly achieve this goal, possibly, and you tell people a story about it, we've seen what people have done with these token incentives so far to get people to buy into a vision and to actually build that vision. Ethereum wasn't what it is today five years ago. It was uh, a white paper and some ideas tied to a token and then this got built and that's fascinating and if we can do that then uh i think we can do a lot of things like it sounds far-fetched to be like oh let's just tie private wealth to commonwealth and as they both increase they they get better together like it sounds crazy but i think if you just build a token that could possibly do that and tell people hey this is what you're going to build like I, i'm not going to build it this is what you're going to do with this thing i think the same story plays out the way it did with ether and i think we're going to figure it out yeah, it, there is a feeling of sort of inevitability about it, Neron, that we're sort of like, it, we're too far, too far over the waterfall that like, it's, it's like too late for this not to be a real thing, you know, for, for governments or central banks to feel threatened by the public's ability to launch tokens. Like we, we like know too much. It's like too late for them to sort of thwart our efforts. 
and that now it's just sort of a matter of time before the world realizes, holy shit, this is like now possible. We can create value out of thin air. And, you know, when people talk about like 21st century abundance, like Neuron, I know exactly what you mean about the fact that it sounds very far-fetched because people talk about, oh, we like, I want to live in this post-abundance world. And I have to sort of, I feel bad because I have to be like, guys, like it's already possible now. Like just wait, like strap in, get ready. Because like the next hundred years, I, it, in my opinion, this seems like the most, like obvious thing that's going to happen and and i think it's really going to change you know you see a lot of these like very grassroots sort of political action in the states but also like around the world and imagining what what people who are so empowered um who are so passionate about you know their communities having the ability to to mint these currencies and to to sort of spread their cultures like it really does seem like we can like create abundance out of thin air and and that sounds very hokey and magical and i remember i think that's like sort of how i ended my def con talk was like so if you could create a culture, you can like kind of change the world. And I, it felt really cliche saying it at the time, but like that was what it felt like. And I, and I still feel that way that like, it, it, it seems sort of inevitable that this is going to be possible. It's just a matter of time. And, and for us, I think like a matter of, of shaping the way that it goes, right? To make sure that people, that, that the story unfolds the right way, that people remember that community, uh, 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 sort of stewardship is important, remembering that the commons are this like, important thing, that we, we ha we're starting with a blank slate and that we as, as actors within the system early on in Ethereum, like have a role to play in how we share that with the rest of the world to not just say, hey, this is a tool to make you incredibly rich or you and your friends incredibly rich, but it's a tool to like make everybody rich to, to sort of increase the, the, the sort of rising tide lifts all boats sort of perspective. And, and, and that's on us. That's like when we talk about how do we like, bring this to to the mainstream how do we cross the chasm it's like the way in which we cross that chasm will determine what ultimately the mainstream ends up perceiving and i think you know new york times articles love to to describe our space as like oh everyone's getting rich and you're not but that's like the sort of beautiful irony is like you could be getting rich too like you just have to figure out you know you just have to sort of follow the playbook you have to do the thing um but that's sort of my final thoughts on this because I think that's like a that's where I ended off with my like with my talk and where I've ended off with my thinking on this is like it's just a matter of time until abundance is now possible uh, in a very grassroots way. Uh, I couldn't agree with that more, uh, and I really like your perspective on like uh, the early people in Ethereum having this huge responsibility. <laughs> like, um, <clears throat> there's there's we think that there's, whole, there, there's a whole story that's going to play out with this technology and it's not guaranteed to be good. <laughs> like uh, it's guaranteed to be powerful, I think, but uh, it really depends how we scare it. It depends what we tell people. It depends the values that we lay out at the beginning when we start something new. And I think the more we think about that, the more care we put into it and the more uh, like-minded people we bring into the fold, uh, I think the more likely the story is to play out well for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in trying to go back to Mark, your initial point of like, what do we do from here? I mean, uh, just to speak like on like why kernel has become so important for me is like, first of all, it's like, I feel like I'm learning a lot, just like not only from like building community, but, but the actual like learn track materials, like, like that Andy has been putting together, I think is like really important to think about like, like one of the things that we are now allowing is for individual sovereignty at levels never seen before. And then the second follow-up question is like, what are you gonna do with all your new found independence? And like, what, what, um, like the outcomes of, of such a technology and the power of such an outcome is like proportional to like how many people we can convince that positive sum games are worth playing. And, and the answer is like, we can't convince anyone. We, we only can live it ourselves. And if we live it ourselves enough um, and show people that like living the positive some way in one aspect, or, you know, you can, you can choose other like principles, like that, 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 that leads to the outcomes we're looking for is, is the only way to, to like, or the best way to consider like positive outcomes for everybody. But um you know, I guess the other part of kernel is like starting with the people and like trying to like say that like if we get great groups of people together and say that this is a long term game, um, you like of course might start a company here and maybe should talk about that. But 
but more importantly, you should just like know these people because they'll be, be with you for the next decade. It, it makes me happy that what Alex, you said, like you feel confident and comfortable reaching out to anyone because that was ultimately the first like operating goal. It was like, it doesn't matter what you're building. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Just like, this is your, this is yeah. a group that you can, you can lean upon. Yeah, especially like this group is, I think, like this fellowship is three months long, right? Like it's pretty short term, but um, if there's going to be like group collaborations and other things like this, uh, playing the long game, like this relationship will last uh, into much longer than this. And it's happened in other fellowships like uh, On Deck or like other uh, Silicon Valley and stuff. And so it's really nice to have this made online with a purpose that's like... Um, ad hoc right no one is forced to do anything it has to be proactive and this is the right behavior we want to incentivize and so yeah great job on this it's great that feels like a good place to to end off for this junto thank you guys all for for coming this has been wonderful and, and very surprisingly different we, t we covered a lot of different ground than what we did in the first one so if you guys didn't actually get a chance to, to watch that first junto it's probably worth watching uh, again just as a different we, we had a very different perspective and a lot of different conversations but yeah I'm, I feel very you know fired up about this sort of thing and and, and very hopeful also about the, the sort of future that we we can be in so um, yeah thank you guys all for coming and um, yeah, I look forward to what's coming up next. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, everybody, Mark. Thanks, guys. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thanks, everybody. We'll thank you. you. Bye. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Bye. Bye. <laughs>